Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 126. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, a little bit of that quiet period right now. Steelers rookie minicamp, not until next weekend, Mother's Day weekend. So right now things are kind of calm, but it seems like the Steelers uh, GM, Omar Khan, Mike Tomlin doing some media tours right now. And uh, you got some film rooms to talk about. Yeah, it's going to be a busy Friday, I think, overall, and hopefully a little bit more Omar Khan stuff coming in. I think he's supposed to do an interview or has already done an interview with Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk that will probably hit the web, I think, soon sometime. And uh, we got a little bit of a treat uh, on, I guess it was recorded Wednesday on Sirius XM uh, radio with uh, Pat Kerwin and Jim Miller with Omar Khan on that show gave us quite a few things to talk about there. And you're right. I've gone deeper into the uh, Washington tape and contextualized all those targets that he had. So uh, let's get after it on this Friday. Uh, let's start uh, with some Pittsburgh Steelers rookie minicamp news. Again, that won't take place until next weekend, but we know a couple of names who will be there from the XFL. And we knew that Pittsburgh had 87 spots open, wondered if they were going to look at some XFL guys. There were at least two that are coming in for tryouts, but it seems like maybe that's just a, a placeholder until they can sign their contract. We'll explain that in a moment. But the two names from the XFL that will be invited to Steelers rookie minicamp are offensive tackle. Chidi Koki and the big name here is wide receiver Hakeem Butler, former fourth round pick, was kind of a, a draft neck favorite coming out of Iowa State in the, I think, 2019 or 2020 NFL draft, a true height, weight, speed guy, never panned out in the NFL, but had a really strong XFL season, eight touchdowns, almost 600 yards, and I didn't pay Super close attention to the XFL this year, but whenever I kind of casually watched, it, to me, it, it did always feel like Akeem Butler was on my TV screen. So, you know, obviously <laughs> his NFL career has not uh, really worked out so far, but that's a probably the most notable name that will be part of the Steelers rookie minicamp outside of, of course, their rookie class. Yeah, you hit that. Uh, that's a guy we've talked about before, isn't it? It's been, oh, yeah. It's been since, what, I think 2019. But, uh, uh, yeah, definitely a guy that uh, you know, we paid, paid attention to. I think they had, uh, was it Brandon Hunt that I think that you spotted at that pro day several years ago? I couldn't uh, tell. It was, it was somebody. It was either him or Bruce McNaughton. I could never okay. uh, make, make sh- uh, certain of that. Yeah. And, uh, as you mentioned, a height, weight, speed guy, and, uh, he comes into the NFL and obviously his career hasn't gone, uh, as many probably thought it would, at, you know, at the NFL level. And, you know, he finds his way over to the, uh, XFL and you're right. He did have, uh, quite the season with the, with the, with the battle Hawks over there and Bruce Gridkowski's the offensive coordinator over there. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of a, I guess you could call it a link of some sort there. And he, he was, you know, I, you go back and look at you know, the highlights only. He, he, he certainly did stand out and he's a guy that probably, you know, as he comes over to the Pittsburgh Steelers mini rookie mini camp here, uh, a guy you would have to think, you know, get, get some looks as kind of a big slot kind of guy. I think that's kind of where he fits best at, at, at this point. Uh, I think uh, uh, his time in the NFL so far, you know, not, not, not a premier route runner by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I, I think he still needs some work there. Uh, the hands, obviously a little bit of, su- uh, you know, suspect when it comes to that, but you know, he, he, he did, I guess what you would say he was supposed supposed to do at the XFL level. And that was dominate. Right. And that now has, he's parlayed that into a 
uh, and, and invite the students rookie mini camp. And I, I, I think kind of along this process and understanding a little bit more about the rules coming out of these developmental league uh, uh, leagues is the fact that you're right. They probably are reserving a couple of these roster spots because those guys coming out of the developmental league can't officially sign an NFL contract until those leagues end. Correct. Right. Uh, according to one XFL reporter, XFL players cannot sign contracts until May 15th when the season officially concludes. And that basically coincides with rookie minicamp for Pittsburgh, which will run May 12th through the 14th. And so the day after that Monday, uh, those XFL players, if earned, can sign a contract. So my 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 guess is both those guys, Butler and a Koki, will sign their contracts and they're being invited to mini camp to get exposure, make sure they do look okay and make sure nothing catastrophic happens during that, that weekend and their workout, but uh, probably are signing their contracts the following day. That certainly does sound right. Uh, now that we, we, we are getting some more uh, facts and, and, and things related to the rules uh, come to surface here and look, I mean, I don't hate it. You know, uh, whether or not either one of those two, you know, Cheedy or, or, or Keen Butler ultimately work out or not. I mean, they're obviously they, they're they're both, you know, long shots, I would think, to make the 53 man roster. But uh, at least you've got, you know, some NFL experience with both those guys and, you know, they'll get the opportunity more than anything else. And, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. But uh, this is uh, the year of the beef, is it not? Uh, where, where, where's the beef? Uh, uh, Omar Khan certainly has, uh, made it a point to bring in, you know, those, those bigger body guys here. We talked about how we thought another tackle or two or three might be on the way. And you, you obviously get one, uh, in, in, you know, in a, in a semi experienced guy, you know, uh, cheaty there. So, uh, this will be interesting to watch. Uh, I, you have no, sh- uh, uh, shortage of excitement, I don't think, at, at at this point of the off season, right? Yeah, it's been you know pretty continuous in terms of the news and even the rookie mini camp ads. So Pittsburgh is cornering the market on Cheaties and Keanu's. It feels like they're uh, right. they're getting all those guys and Benton and Neil and of course Chidi Iwoma, who works for the Steelers as a scout and and now Koki the uh, offensive tackle. But yeah, I know at receiver it feels a bit crowded right now. But you just bring in talent, you know, bring in a good guy like Butler to get to get to convince him to come to Pittsburgh. I thought was pretty interesting because I'm sure he had interest elsewhere. So uh, maybe there's a relationship there with Frisman Jackson or just Mike Tomlin selling it. I'm not quite sure, but excited for that. And um, I'm sure Butler will speak to the media during rookie minicamp weekend and we'll see what he has to say. Absolutely. So uh, going going to be a fun next weekend to pay attention to. Some other Steelers news here. The team recently announcing that David Morehouse has been promoted to a larger role in a different title, uh, now carrying the title as executive vice president for strategy. That was announced by the Steelers and team president, Art Rooney II. Gotta love the buzz titles. They're executive VP for strategy. You probably will know more of what this may or could mean than I do, but what are your thoughts, if any, on this promotion? Yeah, you know, probably related to Acrosure Stadium and, 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 and specifically, I mean, you know, it, it's not hard to speculate the age of uh, what Acrosure Stadium is right now. And you look around the, <coughs> the league and kind of the trends after X amount of years and, you know, uh, this this could have something to do with 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 the initial groundwork for for pit, for for the Steelers to have a new stadium. And when is the lease up or the you know the details for Acrosure right now in terms of the stadium itself? Is that it? we we've talked about that? I don't know a couple couple weeks more than a couple weeks ago, maybe back in February. Yeah, I want to say like twenty thirty or something was uh, the time when that the, the lease for the land would expire and we start talking about maybe new stadium. I mean, I think that would come earlier. Obviously you, you're not going to build a new stadium right as that lease is ending and do that, you know, in advance, but what's the timetable that we had discussed on, on that? Are you finding anything? Uh, on that? Uh, well, you actually wrote about this back on July 12th, 2022 with lease ending in 2030 art Rooney, uh, uh, optimistic to remain in same location. 
So the Steelers' 30-year lease uh, to their current uh, home expires in 2030, but team president Art Rooney II struck an optimistic tone about remaining in the team's current location. We'd love to, to, and we assume we'll extend the lease at some point uh, at that time. Maybe this will have something to do with having a lot of improvements done to Acrisure Stadium. You know? Sure. There's been so, some renovations lately, and and obviously any decision is going to have to be made a couple of years in advance at right. least. You're not going to make that decision in 2030, obviously, um, whether you're going to extend it or, or, or try to push for a new stadium. I hope they stay just from a location standpoint because it's so perfect right there in the heart of downtown, right across the street from PNC Park. It's a really good area to, of course, be. And if they, they had to go somewhere else, then you're kind of pushing more out of the downtown area, you would think. And that's never ideal for fans. Let's see here. Uh, one other wrinkle in the deal uh, are the differing differing terms between the Steelers' lease and Akershire's contract. Uh, the lease is up in two, 2030, while Akershire's deal runs through 2036. Boy, that sounds so futuristic. <laughs> it's not that far away, though, is the scary part. Twelve-year-old <laughs> uh, uh, me would be really uh, wondering what, what it looks like about right now. Like, uh, where, where are the flying uh, Jetsons cars at about right now? <laughs> uh, let's see. What happens if the Steelers were to build a new stadium? Rooney declined to closely examine that possibility. And once again, this was from... Uh, July 12th, 2022. Uh, he says, I certainly hope that we're here for longer than 2030. Uh, obviously, different contracts have different terms and you deal with them as the terms expire and we'll be dealing with that uh, in the future. It may not be me. Hopefully it's somebody named Rooney, but some of those things will happen further down the road. But things like this allow us to be competitive uh, in Pittsburgh. That's the bottom line. So I mean, hey, you know, it's hard to speculate from 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 a top, but didn't Morehouse play play a part in you know the Penguins' uh, home and all like that? I believe so. I don't know his background super closely, but he's been involved with the Penguins, and I assume some of their their different locations. Sure. All right. So rolling in together a report from a year, uh, coming up on a year ago, I guess, and then. This, I, I don't know, may, maybe it's more geared toward uh, upgrades at Acrisure, at least initially, you know, especially if they want to uh, stay in, you know, uh, extend the lease past 2030. But here's the thing, like you mentioned, is we're in, what, 2023 now, 2030. I mean, you, you have to start getting some, some wheels in motion at some point, and this could be the early stages of that. Yeah, I would say within the next three to four years, you're probably going to make a call on what you want to do. And if you want to stay, I don't know how long would, would another lease be? I don't think it'd be 30 years because then you're talking about a 60 year old stadium right. by the time that's done. So maybe, a, you know, you do a, a five year lease, a 10 year lease, something like that. I, I'm not entirely sure of the mechanisms. I don't pay much attention to this stuff. And of course, if you try to, you know, get the funding for a new stadium, there's the whole, you know, debate discussion about taxpayer money and location right. and all the million things that come along with that, which are certainly outside of my area of, of expertise. So, you know, maybe more house will be part of that for, for any direction that Pittsburgh will go. And look, I mean, uh, they spent what 30 years at three rivers, right? And yeah, exactly. And nowadays it, you know, uh, 30, 30 years seems like a long time, uh, as compared to back in the older days, right? Especially, you know, teams shared uh, baseball and, and NFL teams shared ballparks and all like that. But nowadays you, you see some of these new, new, new stadiums and on it's, it's newer and better and bigger, you know? Right. Uh, so it will be interesting to see. I, I would imagine that probably one of these next times that uh, Art Rooney II, you know, makes the rounds or whatever, uh, possibly around training camp time, Maybe more of the questions will be uh, for him will be more related to, you know, obviously talk about the team and all like that, but uh, uh, potentially what are the updates on, you know, the lease past 2030. And if indeed this is maybe a look towards a new stadium or upgrades or whatnot, but we got plenty of time to worry about that. We do. So we'll transition off of that and let's jump into what Omar Khan and Mike Tomlin have been saying. 
thought Mike Tomlin really unexpected had an Instagram video come out uh, yesterday that talked about just uh, unprompted about why he loves drafting siblings and brothers for for the Pittsburgh Steelers to Herbix being the the latest example. And it seems like this is going to be the first in a couple uh, of series of videos Mike Tomlin's going to have kind of, you know, football 101 and in, inside the mind of Mike Tomlin. And, you know, nothing Tomlin said about why he loves drafting, you know, siblings and brothers was earth shattering. But he talked about the tangible, the football genetics and the intangible as well about guys that grew up in didn't just dream of the NFL. They aspired to be in it because they were directly involved with their brother, you know, watching him go to the NFL, TJ watching JJ, for for example. So um, kind of a cool look behind the veil for Mike Tomlin, and hopefully we'll get more of that in the future. Sign me up for two or three of those a week, Alex. But uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> I don't think Tomlin's going to agree with two or three a week. <laughs> oh, oh, come on now. Uh, that was a nice change to get. And uh uh, almost his version of the terrible take, right? You know, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, we're billing the Tomlins for the, royalties, the, the, the Tomlin take, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, this had to be in, in response to that gift you put up the other day, right? <laughs> I don't think it was, if it was Mike Tomlin, got to find some other things to do, man. Uh, look, it's no secret uh, that, that this team loves its bloodlines and, 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 and links to, uh, you know, uh, family and all like that. But, uh, it, 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 you know, it was good to see him kind of, uh, talk for three minutes on it and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, the reasons behind it and, you know, his thoughts on it. So I, I enjoyed that. And, uh, I look forward to uh, him doing maybe a few more of those the, 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 this off season. Uh, Mike Tomlin also joined, what was it, Sirius with Willie Cologne, I believe Mad Dog Radio. Let me try to see what all he said there. I guess uh, he talked about uh, upgrading the offensive line and that Kenny has to develop a security team like the one that Ben had. And so you really see the Steelers' emphasis on O-line in part just to get better there, but also to, of course, protect its uh, future franchise quarterback. Yeah, it was an interesting way he kind of framed that, and he had fun with it too, talking about Cologne and 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 you know, all those offensive linemen back when you know ba- basically you know Ben Roethlisberger had him a a, a security detail, I guess you'd uh, uh, call it. But uh, uh, look, I, you know, it, it, this is Kenny's show now, and you know, I think you've seen this past off season the uh, emphasis on surrounding him uh, now with his own kind of security detail, if you will. And, you know, we'll see how this moves forward. You know, that you've, you've got a couple of older guys on there now in, in, in Sayamalu and, you know, obviously uh core has been around for a little bit and, you know, James Daniels is, is, is in a rookie, you know, by any means. And, you know, you got the future there, hopefully uh, in, in, in a new uh, left tackle there. So, yeah, that uh, was interesting the way Tomlin phrased some of that stuff, for sure. And my biggest takeaway, honestly, from that was less about Tomlin's comments and more of the Twitter comments that I got, people wondering and, and asking, when did Ben ever have a good offensive line? And I think how quickly we forget about how strong the line of Villanueva, Foster, Pouncey, DeCastro, and Gilbert all in their prime or they were a tremendous offensive line that had such cohesion and, and worked so well together. I know they fell off at the end. And so generally right. people remember kind of how things end. And obviously the group kind of fell apart uh, in those later years. But I think we kind of forget and, and take for granted how good that line was in their prime. Yeah, look, I mean, and, and, and Max Starks, obviously, you know, not going to be uh, go down in the annals as, you know, an unforgettable uh, but I mean, he, he, he played a prime part for several years on that offensive line too. And he was massive, <laughs> uh, on top of it. So, uh, you know, it's just a shame that one Super Bowl they couldn't have had a completely healthy offensive line with Marquise Pouncey and all like that, uh, on top of it. But, but, uh, make no mistake about it there. I mean, for, for a while, the, especially the interior of that offensive line, uh, was, was one of, if not the best in the league, right? Yeah, it was right up there. And so I know, you know, throughout when, when when Ben got to Pittsburgh, he had a good offensive line and then it became really bad. And then they built that thing up with the Castro, Pouncey, Gilbert. It became, you know, good, really good. And then it fell off towards the end. So it ebbed and flowed throughout Ben's career. But there were certainly long stretches of, of, of a time in the 2010s where that offensive line was really quality in front of Ben and for Le'Veon Bell. And they all worked together. But 
Um, I just I just saw some of those comments about, you know, when did Ben ever have a good offensive line? And he had a good offensive line for a, a good portion of his career. Yeah, he did. Uh, is there anything else from Tomlin? That was kind of it to, to me, honestly, in terms of what Tomlin had. To yeah, say. in that one interview, that was that was it. And obviously we, we just hit on what, what he said in the Instagram video there. Omar Khan also making some of the media rounds, as we mentioned uh, earlier in the show. He was on also Sirius Radio, I think. I'm trying to I'm getting mixed up in terms of where he was at. Yeah, he was on Moving the Chains. We love our, we right. love Moving the Chains and, and what those guys do over there. And I think the, the headline that I'm taking away from that, and maybe I'm a little biased be, in terms be, of... <laughs> be careful here. <laughs> a little biased in terms of what my takeaway was. But Omar Khan talking about Nick Herbig and saying that they... Uh, expect to play him inside and outside. And here's the quote from Omar Khan about her big quote. We think he can play inside and outside for us. So we love that flexibility End quote. And so we knew when the, the pick was announced and, and, and Denzel Martin came out to talk about Nick Herbig over the weekend. He talked about him as an outside linebacker. I think Dave and I certainly had issue with that thought. And now Omar Khan is talking about the flexibility and at least mentioning the possibility of her big playing off-ball linebacker in, adi- in addition to playing outside linebacker. Uh-oh, the worm's turning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't wait. Uh, and look, that was, uh, I don't know how many of you listening also have a subscription and and, and, and heard that uh, interview on Moving the Chains. By the way, and I, I say this every, I don't know, six weeks or so, <laughs> if you want if you want good radio, good, good sports radio, uh, and I mean, look, it's got a share of bad stuff as well, too. But uh, I, I really think they do a great job over there at Sirius XM uh, Radio, uh, especially moving the chains with Pat Kerwin and Jim Miller. Very entertaining show. And they take calls and all like that. And they have great guests on and they ask very good questions. And, you know, when they got to the part of basically what they did in this interview on on, on Wednesday with Khan is they just rolled through the draft picks mm-hmm. and, you know, they would they would would throw out their initial take on, you know, a player and then kind of unprovoked, throw it over to, uh, to, to, to Omar Khan for, you know, his kind of extended thoughts and all like that. So uh, it was really, they, it's not like they'd led Omar Khan down any kind of road uh, on any of these players. And thus when he did get to Herbig, it was an, 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 an unprovoked uh, response in the fact that he's, that he said, you know, he can play inside uh, or outside uh, for us. And uh, I immediately reached for my tinfoil hat and made, made sure it's ready for the season and, and, and put it on my head and mm-hmm. made sure, made sure it was fit, 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 you know, uh, well, uh, anything to Omar Khan using inside first and instead oh, of, in- and that is on really tight, <laughs> isn't it? Got to strap down. Yeah, in, in, instead of outside, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm obviously being funny here because of the fact that, you know, Alex and I have talked throughout this process of how we think uh, Herbig best, you know, might fit at the NFL level here. But uh, uh, it, it is it is quite of a change, at least from a week ago when they sent Denzel into that room and, you know, talked about you know, really didn't even entertain any idea about him being inside. And then now you have the general manager uh, less than or right around a week, less than a week later saying, well, he can play inside or outside. Now, how many times do you really see a guy play inside and outside? Yeah, it's not that often unless you're dealing with like a high end type talent, the Micah Parsons that has that just, you know, he could play running back and be an awesome running back, but he's just a freak guy like that. But I think you lean on guys, you know, skill sets and what they do well. And Herbig, you know, can rush the passer. And so can he, you know, have some sub packages where you're, you know, lining him up on the edge like they used to do with, you know, Lawrence Timmons and and Vince Williams and and guys like that. So, you know, I think at at, at this point, I think we've heard all we can hear from the coaching staff. Now it's let's see it in action. Let's see what the reports are uh, during OTAs. When we get to training camp, obviously we'll be getting eyes on that and watching very closely where her big aligns. So at this point, I think it just wait and see and let's put a, put them on the field and see how it looks. You know, a lot of people, I think, forget, you know, going back and we hit on this a little bit with uh, Dick LeBeau recently about, you know, when, when, when Lawrence Timmons came into the league and uh, there was kind of that kind of that question with him too. Is he an inside guy? Is he an outside guy? And, you know, they kind of brushed that off at the beginning too. 
uh, uh, during those early press conferences, if, if, if memory serves me. And I think you fast forward into uh, Timmons' uh, rookie season. Uh, he was primarily special teams, right? I mean, uh, and, and, and I think uh, we don't have snap totals from that far back. So I'm going to have to actually maybe on Saturday or Sunday, I might do this, go back and pull some old, old, old games from 2007. I don't remember him playing a ton of defensive snaps. Maybe he, maybe he, uh, maybe he did get a handful of snaps at edge occasionally, but it, 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 you know, it didn't into his, I guess, second and third years when the transition took, uh, took hold and he moved inside. So, uh, and back then, you know, you're a young player coming into a come coming into a defense, a Dick LeBeau defense. You didn't get on. It took a lot. It took a lot to get on the field to get any defensive snaps. Right. Uh, Nowadays, uh, obviously, especially with your early round guys, you you get those guys on the field as soon as possible. Uh, Now, you know, based on the depth chart and obviously Watt and Highsmith, and we'll see what else happens here. Uh, especially at the edge position moving forward on into the off season. Uh, you know, I, I, I would tend to think that, you know, we're going to see a lot of Herbig on special teams during his rookie season and probably not so much on a defensive side of the field. So we'll, it will be interesting though, to see uh, from starting at rookie rookie mini camp on into training camp and, and, you know, obviously the start of the season, where he, where he's getting snaps at, you know, and and Con made mention of that as well in the same thought, talking about how excited he was for Herbig on special teams, and and I'm with Con. I think Herbig could be a, a core guy basically out of the gate. And you're right, just looking at the broad box score in 07, Timmons rookie year, zero starts, had 15 tackles for the entire season. So I assume that's you know mostly a special teams kind of guy, maybe a little bit of defense uh, in there. So. If Herbig is, is only is if Herbig is going to be primarily a special teams guy, then not to beat the dead horse again, but who's your number three outside linebacker if it's not going to be that much on Herbig? Yeah, to be determined, right? I mean, I I I, I wouldn't be surprised if this team if this team still managed to get another edge in there somewhere. I'm with you. Uh, now, who that guy is? I mean, real, I took a real, real quick, I, I pulled this. Uh, mm-hmm. It was. Uh, how many total tackles did Timmons have in his 2007 rookie season? According to PFR, 15. All right. Looks like he had uh, 11 total on special teams that year. Okay. So four, we'll call it defensively. And, and tackle stats can vary slightly depending on is it the team that's using it or, or PFR, but Basically, he was a special teamer year one, which tracks with how Pittsburgh's rookies played back then. All right. Now, this is from the league's official stats site. So uh, and it's broken down by by special teams and defensive player snaps. And it's saying uh, 10 tackles and one assist for 11 total tackles there. Now, uh, it does also tell me that two he had two tackles on defense that year. one one tackle, one assist, and both came in week twelve. Well, I know what game I'm going to go watch. <laughs> uh, week twelve, two thousand and seven. In two thousand and eight, according to the leagues, uh, he got a lot more burn in two thousand eight on the defensive side of football. He had fifty seven total tackles that year on defense, and another eight on special teams that year. Yeah, I think he was more of a sub package guy in year two because he only technically started two games, but had, as you just said, 57 tackles. So I don't know exactly what that package was, probably nickel passing situations, but I think that's how they kind of began to rotate him into the defense. All right. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to hear Omar, you know, you would have to think he's got a couple more interviews to go the rest of this off season here. Uh, see see how much more often he is asked about Herbig and his potential fit moving forward. 
Yeah, he's got one, we assume, with Mike Florio. He was supposed to be on the Pat McAfee show yesterday. That was rescheduled. I was told it'll happen in a couple of weeks because uh, Pat McAfee had the birth of his child yesterday. So congrats to him. So I'm sure we'll hear from Khan several more times before training camp rolls around. All right. What else uh, uh, stuck out to you when he was rolling down through the draft picks there on 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 moving the chains? thought he had an interesting comment, kind of a revealing comment, although I think it's kind of easy to, to tell even before the words about Corey Trice. And they were asking him, do you see him as a corner or a safety? And, you know, Khan, very emphatic. He's a corner. He's a corner. He says, well, if you look at our at our outside corners and how they're built and their size, you see a pattern there. And he's a corner for us. We think he can do it. End quote. And so that's basically saying we want the big, long, physical dudes. That's Joey Porter Jr. That's Corey Trice, maybe to a bit lesser extent at this point in his career. But Patrick Peterson, certainly no small corner. James Pierre, you get the idea. Bigger outside cornerbacks. That's what Pittsburgh is aiming for. Yeah, that should put to bed any uh, at least of the initial talk coming out of the draft. People wondering maybe if they might be looking at him you know, as a safety. Yeah, I still think he may have to move there. I don't know if he can stick at corner, but obviously Pittsburgh wants to try it because they value and they covet kind of in that Indianapolis, Seattle mold of like the bigger, longer press corner. That's what they want. Okay. Anything else from you, Dave, in terms of what Omar Khan had? I mean, say? I thought, uh, you know, he, they, they talked about, hey, it looks like you're bringing in a lot of uh, big guys uh, this this uh, this offseason. And, you know, is that kind of, you know, the, the the way you're going here is to build big. And I thought, uh, do you have that quote pulled up there on uh, on kind of his vision? Sure. Um, he says, quote, I'll just say that if you look at our signings and our draft picks, I think I would say that those picks and signings are reflective of the vision that we have for the team moving forward. Earlier, it said that Coach Tomlin and I, after the season, we got together with Art Rooney the second and we mapped out a plan and we have a vision for what we wanted our team to look like in 23 and beyond. And so, again, that goes back to very obvious things in terms of the way they've you know increased this offensive line, the size, the physicality, the bully ball that we've talked about, um, and that's reflective in their draft picks as well. So it is very much that collective vision of let's become the physical team, the team that grinds things out, the teams that imposes our will, that can you know win in the four-minute offense, win the low-scoring game. That is how this team is being built. And in in so many words, he was asked about, you know, uh, or reminded that that Porter only had one one interception coming out of uh, coming coming out of college, and uh, maybe that's you know the reason why he fell out of the first round. And uh, you know, Khan said they're not really worried about that. He says obviously his cover skills were extremely attractive to us. The interceptions, hopefully, we can work on that. Uh, and he goes on to say, but his film was good and we were fortunate. We feel fortunate to be able to acquire Joey. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that we talked about, uh, 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 during the pre-draft process with Porter, but in the flip side, uh, going back and saying, you know, you had guys like Ramsey and I forget who else we named on, on, on that list that, that, that came out of college with very few interceptions. And obviously that's not so much. You know, there, there's enough evidence of, of, of pedigree guys coming out and overcoming uh, the lack of, 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 of interceptions, especially if they weren't targeted all that much. I wonder what will work on it means, though. Just hit the jugs machine every day. I mean, because I thought, you know, just kind of watching through some of Porter's tape, there were chances for more interceptions. He dropped a couple. He had a couple that he just couldn't capitalize on. So, you know, how exactly does that look? Because, listen, Pittsburgh is kind of really – prided themselves on being a defense and a secondary that takes the football away. They led the, or they tied for the NFL lead with 20 picks last year, 18 of those coming from the secondary. So it was, if there's one thing that does not fit quite as well with Porter in Pittsburgh is that the Steelers want ball Hawks in the secondary and Porter would not be considered a ball Hawk in terms of finishing the play and taking the football away. Right. Right. Uh, and look, you know, hope, hope, hopefully we'll turn into a guy, you know, at least a four or five interception a year kind of, kind of kid. Uh, but yeah, we'll see about that. So anything else there from Omar Khan on, on Darnell Washington, obviously just talked about the size that he has and just, you know, how rare that is to, to find. Uh, yeah. And talked about, uh, Spencer Anderson and just that position, uh, uh, uh versatility, flexibility, uh, 
it's going to be really interesting to kind of watch where maybe he initially lines up and how much maybe he is moved around during uh, uh, once rookie mini camp and, and, and training camp gets underway. I'm sure he'll be used all over the place. I don't expect this guy to, to stay in one spot for long. Maybe initially that first week or first couple of days, they may keep guys in one spot just so they're comfortable, you know, lining up in one place as they take their first, you know, training camp snaps. But I think certainly you drafted Anderson with that versatility, not just to be the right guard or the right tackle or whatever to, to wear different hats. That's how he's going to create value. That's how he's going to push for a roster spot. So I imagine he'll be playing, you know, multiple positions in training camp. Right. Uh, I would agree there. All right. Uh, I, I tell you one thing, Omar's gotten a lot more comfortable in that interview chair as the off season has gone on. Yeah. Um, I remember that first one that he had is that the combine or something before that, where I felt like he was a little, a little nervous, a little bright yeah. lights hitting them, but uh, he's certainly gotten much better. Yeah. I, I think he's really settled in. Uh, and, and, you know, we probably after, after he finishes, it finishes this media tour here, I'm guessing we probably won't hear too much from him maybe until camp, right? If, if, if yeah, things go and the even, way Colbert uh, uh, did. And even then in camp, you don't really hear from the GM too much. Usually there's right. like that one preseason interview with, you know, Bob Pompiani or something. But basically after that, you don't hear from Cod until, I don't know, until, until, until the combine almost basically. <laughs> right. Like. So we'll see. And Con is at least finally telling us some stuff. I think his first couple of interviews, he would, I think because he was his first, you know, draft process, you don't want to say anything that might give away something. So, I mean, he said nothing. I mean, he was just giving you no information. I think it's easier to do that post-draft once the picks are made. There's more tangible to talk about. Um, but he's at least kind of giving us some information and some, I think, more honest and candid thoughts on these guys. All right. Speaking of Omar Khan, uh, the other day you wrote a post about the, uh, the, the the few differences maybe this time around that, that, that you specifically picked on, picked up on in the uh, pre-draft process and the draft process overall. Uh, there weren't many of them, but uh, I think this morning you have a post up on the similarities uh, uh, with, 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 with Khan taking over as opposed to what we've been following these last several years with Kevin Colbert. So why don't you, uh, why don't you tease that a little bit? Good news, Dave. The Blues clues are alive and well, really from a predictability standpoint, Pittsburgh was as predictable as ever, honestly, maybe even more so than they were under Kevin Colbert, but you know, con hitting the pro day trail, just like Kevin Colbert, old school, you know, boots on the ground mentality. He was at seven pro days this year, all with Mike Tomlin. That's probably as much as, as many as any head coach and GM pairing had. Uh, this year, he was at the Hula Bowl, was at the HBCU Combine, the only NFL GM to to attend that event. So, you know, Khan's a guy that certainly put in the work this year. There's still that correlation between positional coaches, you know, past round one and draft picks. You know, Joey Porter Jr., second round pick, surprising second round pick, but still second round pick having Grady Brown, Terrell Austin at his Penn State Pro Day, uh, Nick Herbig having Aaron Curry at his Pro Day, uh, fourth round pick there. So those, you know, Correlations still seem to exist pretty strongly. And then just the overall focus on athletes and character, heart, smarts, and athleticism. That was kind of the hallmark of the last five, six draft classes of Kevin Colbert. And you're seeing that carry over to this year's draft class. Basically, all but Herbick had a RAS score of nine plus. And all these guys had like squeaky clean, you know, A plus character, great workers, no concerns there. So that's all very much in lockstep with what uh, Kevin Colbert valued so highly. That's a big win for the depot team, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and it makes me feel good going forward about, okay, maybe next year I'll feel more confident in knowing what to expect. Uh, look, I mean, pull up the RAS scores, which in, in way back in the old days when we walked up, uh, uh, walked to school uh, both ways uh, uphill <laughs> in the snow, uh, we used uh, uh, P-Spark. <laughs> <laughs> right. Way back when you're dusting off an old binder. Right. Now, now we use uh, the RAS. Here, here, here's here's the here's the thing, though, that uh, and I, I just can't help but thinking thinking back to the combine and all these last couple of years and all now, uh, man, I hope I, I hope they readjust the schedule somehow where more of these guys do the three cone and the and the shuttle. You know, I just I wonder what the future holds for the combine overall, especially when you have a guy like, you know, is, I know it's few and far between, but you lost a guy like Voorhees during this one. Right. You mm -hmm. know, uh, 
I just, and people say it's only, it's only guys running around in their underwear and all like that. But man, I love watching those drills. Uh, I, I love getting the numbers related to, because we don't, you know, we're not, we're not scouts. We don't have that inside uh, info to, to pre combine uh, 40 times and pre pre combine, you know, uh, shuttle and, 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 and those kind of drill times and all like that. So, and, and it, it is kind of an introduction, if you will, uh, to the class, you know, kind of a second introduction or third introduction uh, of the class to us annually, because obviously by then you have the, uh, the senior bowl and the shrine bowl and the NFL PA bowl. But I, I really value getting that info and, and, and watching those drills and all you know, during the combine. And I wonder what the future holds for that kind of moving forward year by year. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, people will downplay the idea and say it's silly to focus on a couple of these times, but to me and, and to you, I think as well, it builds that athletic profile. You want to just get as much information on the player as you possibly can and, and get as many numbers and data points on the guy as much, as much as you can to try to predict and project the odds of his success. And we're not using solely one number to, to predict that, but it's one piece of that, that large puzzle. And so the more that you can do, um, the more information you have on a guy, the more you can try to project and evaluate him and maybe the more comfortable you would be in taking a guy as opposed to not having as much information and just feeling less comfortable about the profile of the man and the, and the player that you're getting. So we value those numbers. And again, we're the whole, I think ethos of the site is marrying the tape and the stats, not, you know, not right. using just one, not just the other combining both and having a healthy relationship with both. And so the more that we get in terms of the data, the more we can apply both those things. Right. It's, it's just a, it's, it's just a piece of the puzzle for us as we, as we go through this as outsiders, for sure. My biggest issue with uh, the RAS is I, I never know how to say it because you really shouldn't say, I guess, RAS score because it's kind of like saying ATM machine, you know, scores in the world, oh, relative brother, athletic here score, we go. score, ATM machine. So I guess you just say RAS. I don't, I, that's like my biggest thing. I don't know how to properly say the word RAS or the, the phrase R, R, RAS. Well, get used to me using it improperly <laughs> then because I always say RAS score. Right. So. But that is like you are saying relative athletic score, score. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> Well, I stutter anyway, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, fair enough. I did this while I'm reading my article today. I just wrote RAS scores too, but I guess that is technically redundant, but you're probably gonna all, all going to have to live with that. But but look, I mean, it's a huge piece of the puzzle, especially for us yeah. in, 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 in the Blues Clues, along with uh, finding out who is where at the pro days and who's coming in for, I mean, we we have done this for quite a few years now, and, you know, it's helped us, it's helped us build that, that name, that list of 50 names uh, come come final mock draft time that we're kind of choosing from. Yeah, Pittsburgh, and this is, you know, previous classes and this year class, this year's class as well, but has a very clear, like, they want athletes. I think, like, since they whiffed on Jarvis Jones, they're like, we are going to take athletes. We're never <laughs> going to draft a non-athlete again. And so there's a very clear line between if you have a, you know, poor RAS number, you're not going to be in contention to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. All right, and I'll tease the listeners here. Alex and I are thinking about uh, maybe next year adding something new to the pre-draft uh, process, and and maybe sending a couple of the guys out to you know maybe these kind of closer, uh, bigger, uh, more notable pro days. So we're we're we're, we're tossing that idea because man, I hate missing not not knowing everybody who's who is at a certain pro day you know we didn't miss many of them i don't think this year but uh you know it it, it would be nice then to have them there for the media sessions and all like that so maybe, maybe we'll look into doing uh some of that uh, a little more of that or some of that uh moving forward in the next off season so we'll, we'll stay tuned for that yeah, absolutely. We're always looking to expand. Just one last note on the RAS. Um, I think even the NFL might be more open to it. I mean, I always see if it's worth anything. I think it is. Jim Nagy is always tweeting about RAS and is always referencing it. So, I mean, I think it's a number that the NFL is begin- beginning to to value as well. Yeah, once again, I'll go back to the fact that I hope that three cone and that, that short shuttle don't 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 go away like the dodo bird, you know. I don't think you're going to get your wish there on that I one. Know. I think over the time it's going to be, I mean, at least, at least a lot of guys do it at their pro day. Most guys don't do it at the combine, but,
but many of them kind of finish it off at their pro day. So it, it, at least there's that. Although, I mean, Porter didn't do it. Did Jones do it? I don't think Broderick did it. I don't think so. I don't have it in front of me here. Yeah, and, wh- and why aren't these more of these colleges maximizing more on pay-per-view of their pro days or something like that? You know, well, that- I imagine only if the big schools are going to draw enough eyes. Like, I know we would watch, you know, every pro day out there, but I think we're kind of outliers. Well, then then why not make it pay-per-view or something where, uh, you know, a, 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 every person watching earns you money, you know, that way. I, I don't know. I Maybe we're just that big of geeks, but <laughs> I think we are. I think that's safe to say at this point. All right. And, and speaking of geeks, you went through your first contextualization of the uh, post-draft class on Donald Washington that is stickied to the top of Steelers Depot for you guys to check out. So that's breaking down basically every single target that Washington had in 2022 uh, with the Georgia Bulldogs. So what are your, your thoughts and maybe takeaways on Darnell Washington? Yeah, I uh, went through all 45 times last season in 15 games that he was targeted. He caught 28 of those 45 for 454 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, one other target that he had in that uh, first game, second, second, I think it was the second target he had uh, of, of the season was against uh, Oregon. And, and that was a short catch and run uh, that was uh, wiped out by a, uh, by a penalty. So that, that one didn't count there, but uh, some main takeaways from this. Uh, I always like to look, uh, especially if you have a, you know, at least, you know, 40 or so more, more targets on a player in one season here is what the average depth of target was and what the average depth of completion was. His average depth of target was very healthy at 10.38 yards past the line of scrimmage. His average depth of completion was 9.32 yards. Uh, That's nice and healthy. You don't want to see a gap, a huge gap in between, uh, you know, average depth of target versus average depth of of completion, because that means he was, he wasn't catching the longer stuff, but he was catching the shorter stuff there. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's, uh, that's only what a 1.06 differential in, 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 in the averages there. That looks great on paper. Uh, He did quite a bit after the catch in 2022, Alex, uh, 205, what I charted 205, uh, almost half of his 454 receiving yards in 2022 came after the catch, uh, an average of 7.07 yards per reception. If that don't get you excited, uh, I don't know what will. I have him down for two drops in 2022 on his 45 targets. A couple of these incompletions, though, though you'll have to watch the videos to 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 see them probably not some of the best ball placement by uh uh stetson bennett probably could have had a couple more catches had had the ball been on target there obviously you throw in a couple of drops there would have would have added to his uh uh, that would have put him up at at least 30 catches alone uh there uh overall so i i kind of theorized maybe there was about five or six uh targets that were that were left on the table that could have been completions uh last year i like to chart where those uh where those uh targets and completions came from and they were scattered all over the field uh let's see of of the 45 25 of them now obviously between the numbers you know or between the hash marks is a little bit different because the hash marks being wider uh in the college game but 25 came between the numbers and 11 of those came between the hash marks in the middle of the field the 20 others came outside the numbers 11 of his 28 receptions came more than 10 yards past the line of scrimmage and seven of those came more than 15 yards down the field. So that's Mm. exciting in and of itself. Uh, He registered 10 explosive play receptions. So 10 of his 28 receptions resulted in explosive plays of 20 yards or longer with his longest one coming 34 yards. Oh, let's see. He registered 32 total targets of fewer than 15 air yards, and he caught 21 of those. Of his 11 targets with air yards of 15 or longer, he caught seven of those. Uh, In total, uh, let's see, he had nine red zone targets last season. He caught three of those. 
uh, one with two of those obviously resulting in touchdowns and both those touchdown receptions came between the numbers. All right. Uh, all the, after going through, well, uh, I, I, I'll tell you this and I don't know why somebody pushed back on this on, on, on Twitter. <laughs> you obviously saw the, uh, the reception that I posted, uh, uh, uh against Kent state, right? And I saw the reply and I'm, I'm with you, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, he had a heck of a catch against Kent state on the ball that was thrown really you know, behind him, had to contort his body and, and come up with the catch there and nobody's around him at the time. And, uh, I mean, the, 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 the catch really stuck out to me and I posted a clip on Twitter and I think the first response that I got was, uh, yeah, this is all fine and good, but it came against Kent state. <laughs> as if the opponent matters as he's reaching back for the football uncontested. Yeah. And I replied back. I don't care if that came against St. Thomas mini mites, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that I, you know, for that, just a, a weird flex by some people out there that it just goes to show you, no matter sometimes what you put out there, some, somebody going to take issue, uh, mm -hmm. with it, uh, overall, uh, Quite honestly, that I, that might have been his best catch of the season. You know, just from a you know to show that athleticism and and his ability to contort his body and all like that. I I really view that as a very impressive uh, 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 catch of his twenty eight last season. There, my main takeaways when going through all of his uh, reception tape and look, this does not even count. Uh, uh, you know, as a blocking ability or, 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 or anything like that, you know, we'll have another talk in and, and, and breakdown of, of that kind of stuff here as, as the off season uh, wears on here. But uh, I think what you're getting with him is a guy that a, you know, can, can really be a great possession type receiver, uh, closer to the line of scrimmage. I mean, a big, big target. He gives opposing quarterbacks. Uh, he does a good job of catching anything that, 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 that's, that's, that's thrown his way, uh, in that shorter area there, but, uh, that's not all that he is. Uh, he can, uh, catch the football down the field. Now he's not a guy, he's not a burner that, that, that's, 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 you know, going to burn down the field, uh, and probably have a high, uh, percentage of catches, you know, 15 yards down the field, you know, but he can provide that for you. You can run him on some of these, you know, out and ups and, 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 and wheel routes and, you know, that kind of stuff within that. Uh, and he can provide that for you there. Uh, obviously with his size, he is a big target. That's hard to miss. Uh, really like his, uh, catch radius that he provides uh, within that. So you're, 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 you're getting that with him as well too. the, the yards after the catch and just him being a big body. He's, he's, he's a, he's a tough, he's a, he's a tall drink of water. That's tough to bring down to the field. Uh, I think you see some of that athleticism uh, throughout his tape, especially in 2022, his ability to, you know, uh, gets Oregon hurdle over a guy. And I think he's got another hurdle in there uh, somewhere as well, too. Uh, so, so you get that aspect with the yards after the catch. Look, I, you know, I, I know he's going from college to the NFL level, but he, there are going to be a lot of people that really at, at some defensive backs in the NFL level to have to make some business, business <laughs> decisions when it comes to him. And unfortunately, some of those might be go low on him. Like we've talked about, yes. right. Uh, because there's such a huge surface area, you know, from, from below the number uh, on down. So I think he's probably going to have to make a concerted effort maybe to, to, you know, the best he can to kind of protect the lower body of his after the catch. Cause it's really the only way that you can bring a big guy down, uh, uh, like, like him down to the field there. Uh, his route running, you know, not, I don't think it's elite by any stretch of the imagination. I think if there's any one area that, that, that he could probably improve on as he gets into the, into a professional game it, it, it is a route running. But within that, I mean, 
it takes a lot to slow that <laughs> that body down and get in and out of cuts uh, as well, too. And for a guy his size, I think he does it relatively uh, well. I think he does a great job of finding the the uh, the, the softer zone areas of the field. And once again, man, he if he when he turns and flashes those numbers to a qu- quarterback in in you know zone type stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it's hard to miss him. They used him quite a bit on kind of these misdirection, you know, tight end, you know, screens, if you will, will where he's coming across, across the formation and, and, and they're getting the, getting him the ball quick within a uh, yard or two uh, off the line of scrimmage. I think you'll continue to see that at the NFL level, especially because of his ability to run after the catch. Uh, you better have a guy on him early, uh, uh, that can bring him down to the ground because if that first first guy misses, he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna run uh, on, on you in that aspect there. Uh, red zone threat, although he didn't get a lot of red zone targets last year, uh, that obviously because of the size once again is going to be a I, I would think going to be a threat uh, at the NFL level. Uh, just looking at him on the hoof uh, off the line on these targets. Uh, I, I think you've, you've, you've mentioned that lumber, you know, lumber, uh, uh, kind mm-hmm. of player. Um, I, I see, I see where you get some of that from, but I would call him more of an athletic lumber. Uh, how do you define that exactly? Yeah. I mean, he, for, for a guy that, 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 that takes a little, he needs to build up, you know, a little bit, he doesn't, he yeah. does, you know, he doesn't explode, Right. Uh, off the line here. But uh, I think within that lumbering, you see some of that athleticism. So an athletic lumber, uh, I, I I would call him. Uh, he's not super twitchy within that. Right. And, you know, he doesn't explode off of the line. He's got he's a build up uh, type player there. But, you know, once again, a guy that size for him to move that the way he does, I think, is quite Im- Im- impressive overall. Um, he is not George Kittle off the line in a passing game. I think George Kittle gets off the line a lot better. I think George Kittle is a better a better route runner overall. Mm-hmm. But for what this guy can give you in the in the passing game, look, I, you know, he is an upgraded version model of, of, of a tight end two. I mean, he is probably a super supreme tight end two uh, for an offense. Uh, he could probably be tight end one, in, in depending on the offense, obviously, here. What, what caused him to actually drop, uh, I think, maybe the lack of, of, of total receptions, uh, Whatever, and we don't have we don't have obviously the, uh, his medicals or anything like that. You know, wh- whatever injury concerns might have been out there, I think kind of those combined together is probably a, a, uh, enough reason of why he didn't go in the first round, and probably was more in line to maybe go at 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 latest early third round. The rest of the drop on down to where the Steelers got him. I can't really explain. That might be where more of the gift aspect of it came in uh, with him. But, uh, you know, look, just from a receipt, and once again, we're not even talking about what this guy does as, as, as a blocker, uh, uh, as an inline player here. But just from a receiver aspect of him uh, from one season and one season alone, it, it's, it's pretty impressive tape. I think – other reasons why he fell was because this was a historically good tight end class. And so teams that wanted another tight end that, not, that did not want to take on the injury risk could just take somebody else. And then you're had a bunch of teams that gobbled up tight ends early that didn't need to draft a tight end later. And so most of the teams that needed a tight end got one within the first two rounds. And then, you know, Washington kind of falls uh, in part due to that. Yeah. Whenever I say like he lumbers a bit, it's not to say that he's unathletic or Zach Gentry or, you know, late age Matt Spath. He's certainly much more athletic than that. He's just kind of a linear type guy where he works best in a line, a build up speed kind of guy that's not super fluid and super twitchy, as you talked about. Although that, what, what I love about the Kent State catch, not only, of course, him making that catch, but like the body control, the flexibility right. to make that catch or being such a big kind of long dude to kind of go across his body, go down and make that grab. Um, you know, away from 
uh, his frame is is really impressive ex- example of his flexibility and, and, and some of that athleticism that he does have. But yeah, he's just not like, you know, Dalton Kincaid and Luke Musgrave watching those guys how just smooth and fluid they are out of their cuts and running the whole route tree. You know, Washington is never going to be that guy. And that's OK. He certainly can still be a productive guy in the passing game despite that. And yeah, I think certainly yards after contact, the screen game, you know, finally got a left tackle out in space to lead for, for Broderick Jones that, or for um, Darnell Washington, that's going to be really exciting and promising. And this guy's going to fall forward after contact and get two, three, four yards just based on him falling forward in that big frame um, alone. And so uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch him work in this offense. I mean, is he ever going to be a 60 reception tight end in the league? Probably not. Not in Pittsburgh, at least based on how they're, you know, running things right now. Right. But can he be a guy, especially just let's say sole uh, tight end two role? I mean, can he be a guy that, that, that catches 25, maybe even 30 uh, passes, depending on, you know, maybe how he's used in the red zone and third down, you know, situations and, you know, down and distant, you know, I, 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 I think so. And I think he can provide you a nice yards after the catch and, uh, obviously a couple of touchdowns in the red zone. And, and once again, we, we're, we're not even, we're, we're not even discussing what he provides you on the line of scrimmage. I mean, cause he is a six mm-hmm. tackle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like the perfect 12 personnel second tight end that you want, especially for this offense. Again, the way that Pittsburgh wants to build this thing, he's not going to some offense that wants to play, you know, spread football and, and, and put this guy out wide and not ask him to inline block like Pittsburgh wants to do. Wants to use Washington the way that he was used to Georgia, and and that's going to be in line. Why take on the defensive end, climb the linebacker, double team, like all those things are going to be directly in his wheelhouse. So he is an ideal number two tight end, and even a more ideal number two tight end in Pittsburgh's offense. Knowing that Pat Frymuth is an average at best blocker, never really quite developed there, and probably never will to to a degree that you would like. Um, but Washington will take care of that. Right. Uh, and look, I mean, uh, you know, should you have, you know, should fire move miss a game or whatever or two be, because of injury? I, I think he could step in and be your tight end one for a game or, or, or three or four or whatever you need him, need him to be. But uh, uh, it, it was uh, enjoyable to look at all. Of, I, my, you know, my takeaway is, OK, I can see maybe why he or I can definitely see probably why he wasn't a first round pick. Uh, I can see maybe why he would have fallen to to maybe the end of the second round early third round uh but I, I i still don't understand you know fully why he fell as far down as he did well i guess that's where the medical probably mm-hmm. partially comes into play just a quick question on the drops i know it's just just two of them was there any theme were they uh were they like true drops or were they kind of more questionable someone might yell at you and say that's not a yeah, drop yeah I, I i think a couple of them could be you know or both of them probably uh one, one of them, I think, is a drop. The other one may be a pass breakup. Okay. Was there a theme where they, like, over his head? Were they to no, his I, left? I, if I they remember, kind of they, no, I, I think they were to him. Okay. So they, they were just I kind think of they were catchable balls, technically. Like, in his ball. chest, basically. And yeah. like one got broken yeah. up-ish, and one was just him dropping the football. Did he, right. like, take his eyes off the football, or he just... Just drop one. I, I, I was just trying to get it. Uh, I'll okay. have to go back and get more. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll pull both of them. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, but yeah, good study there. Are, are you going to do any other previous years? I know we didn't catch the ball as much in in previous seasons, or is this kind of the one big look through, which is fine on on Darnell Washington? Well, I don't think he had many many catches before that, did he? No, he was pretty light in terms of uh, Man, usage it, the the two years before. I don't know if we're going to learn that much more about him by going through those, but I can definitely pull them and, and take. Okay. A look. You don't have to. I'm just curious. I mean, are you are you going to do something next with like Joey Porter Jr.'s targets or something like? that or yeah i, I might i might graduate harder. into that okay well really good study on on washington and then obviously sure, so. we'll have further talk uh, you know we'll get deeper into some of his blocking tape and all yeah that's gonna be uh really exciting overall so anything else dave any other thoughts again i would i encourage you guys to check out that article from david is stickied top of the page on steelers depot um got anything else dave uh we got any we got uh, uh don't you have a film room on the udfa wide uh kick return is that out already that's going to go up tomorrow i think okay. uh, just for some weekend content some film rooms oh australia will have a film room on, on joy porter jr tomorrow as well yeah with jordan bird 
they're calling him a receiver because I mean he's like a tree tree archer where he was a running back in college, but he you know can't pass protect at all. So I guess they're going to call him a receiver in that sense. But he never really was used as a traditional receiver. He's a return guy through and through. That's going to be his path to make it. I think he does run a bit faster than the four five two that he tested. Um, but he's small, goes down easily on contact, tries to bounce things too much as a runner. Um, obviously, again, this is kind of a, a productive return guy for career return touchdowns, three kicks, one punt. Um, but that's going to be his path. And I'm not even sure what offensive role he'll even have in camp because he's not really a true blue wide receiver. All right. All right. All right. All if right. we, you want to get to some reader emails here? Yep. Let's get to reader emails and close out today's show. Let's see. Charles sent me the link to the uh, Instagram video of Tomlin. Yeah. We, we saw that right after it hit Charles and uh, we, we, we wrote about it uh, yesterday afternoon uh, on, on top of it. So check out that uh, article on what all Mike Tomlin had to say in his Instagram video on, on siblings. Uh, Jim Bendis writes in, I know it's only been a year and we still don't know enough about Pickett and Purdy, but how would you rank the 2022 class now in 2023, a year later versus what you thought of them in 2022? Personally, I find it interesting that Tennessee took a quarterback again two years in a row. Does this mean that Willis will always be a backup quarterback? He says, and congratulations to the team for their excellent draft coverage and predictions. Uh, look, I mean, I, I don't think they're, you know, uh, obviously still learning a lot about Purdy uh, from, 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 you know, his, his time with the 49ers last season. I think really that injury of his is going to, you know, really going to throw some question marks about him, at least uh, a short term uh, future here with him. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't see how you don't come out of uh, right now, at least with initial uh, evaluations and saying Pickett you know, is the best in that class right now. <laughs> well, I think some will argue Purdy um, just based on the success that Purdy had. Obviously, I would counter that by saying he was in a much better situation in the sense of having the talent and the great scheme around him. So I would still put Pick at one and then Purdy two. And then from there, it's kind of uh, most of those guys haven't played. I mean, Howell, Ritter. Yeah, I think with Tennessee, they've kind of soured. Corral. Him yeah, I mean, the, he, he got hurt yeah, last year. Right. So like those guys haven't played. Um, but yeah, with Willis, it does not. That seems to be a miss by me. It's early and we knew he was not ready to play last year and it was no surprise to see him struggle. But obviously, they're um, going in a different direction by trading up for and drafting Will Levis. Right. And look, you know, as I, as I like to say, I, uh, Come come talk to me after all these guys play 20 games. Some of them won't even play 20 games. You <laughs> right. know? Well, that, uh, that's your answer if they don't get to that point. Right, right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Rob Jones wants a, uh, uh, a new stat from Steelers Depot. Maybe a put your ass on the ground stat, whether it's George Pickens, mule kick, putting a DB on his butt, or Broderick Jones pancaking during – during a run running play or, or Darnell Washington swat someone away off the end of the line of scrimmage, Rob, I, I hope we have a lot of, uh, I hope we have enough of that to, to maybe start tracking a stat like that. Uh, uh, rest assured, you will see those clips on the Twitter machine uh, when and if they happen there. Uh, LM writes in, uh, well, while it's all speculation of the 80% need to move more than one year to actually analyze trends, my thought after seeing Alex say their picks fit what they look for, was that the types of players they look for was the same and the pro days were the same. The differences enhancements were that Con and Weidel prioritize value of position within a tier more more all within an increased willingness to move up and down. So hypothetically, had they not had a offensive tackle much higher or had had to get in the first or maybe Benton and Jaden Reed Reed were in the same tier. Colbert would have liked Reed. Con Weidel liked Benton, he says. He says, all I know all that speculation with a jump into conclusions map, but entertain me. What do you say? I mean, it's hard to say what I mean. We we. <sighs> Uh, Luke, this is the type of thing where, I mean, what, I guess, what do we gain ab about speculating about what may or may not have happened had they not gone the way that they've gone? I, mean, I, I, I get it, uh, but we can't, we can't firmly say they would have taken this guy or taken that guy. Sure, but it's hard for us to say firm about anything in the draft other than the picks they actually made. Um, first of all, a very nice office space reference with a jumping to conclusions, Matt. So I do like that. Um, you know, obviously, Weidel 
in, in, in Khan and this front office and Khan making the reference to sitting down after the season with Tomlin and Rooney and saying, okay, this is what we want to be. This is how we want to build this team this off season. And that's very clearly like trench first, bully ball, physical, you know, winning the point of attack. That has been a heavy emphasis. And I don't want to say that Colbert didn't value that, but obviously Pittsburgh's placing a really high emphasis on that this year. So that, so that's fair to say. Um, what I would just say, and I, I made mention of this the other day on Twitter, and I might write about it too, is like, I think people are forgetting how aggressive Colbert was getting at the end of his Steelers tenure, you know, trading up for Devin Bush, trading a first round pick for Minka Fitzpatrick, which was like an earth shattering move at the time that was so unexpected. You know, the, the 2022 free agent hall was, was pretty aggressive, pretty active, active there with Ben's contract beginning to come off the books. Um, he wanted to move up for Kenny Pickett and in 2022 had an offer to Houston Texans declined. And so you, you did move up, but, but he attempted to. So I think, I think throughout the bulk of Colbert's tenure, he was generally more conservative. They trade up a couple times for Troy and, and for Holmes. But I think towards the end, I think he was getting pretty aggressive. And I think we're kind of losing a, a little bit of sight of that based on the moves that the con is making. All right. Uh, Pastor Joe Green, this will be the final one. David, I'm so impressed and thankful Depot, Depot site, the gifted team. You have a similar home run job on the draft. Your best yet. I've been with you from the beginning. Please keep up the good work. Question. If we were to seek a trading partner for Kevin Dotson, what players might you look for in exchange? Any slot players come to mind? Who would you target? Keep up the great work. Look, I, I think at this point now, uh, Pastor Joe, to be honest with you, I think if they trade Dotson at this point, it 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 probably wouldn't be for a player and more for 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 a future draft pick. Yeah, that's my. But, thought. but if I, I mean, were, you know, I, you know, what are you going to get in, in terms of a player that might make your fifty three man roster? I guess probably a similar contract, expiring contract for expiring contract on a rookie deal. So you go for an edge, maybe a slot guy, something like that, probably. Okay. All right. I would agree there. Uh, but uh, definitely something to watch as we move forward uh, on into probably on past training camp. And now, I mean, I expect Kevin Dotson, we said this the other day, now that he's made it through the draft, I, I, I expect him to be around, you know, through, 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 through the summer and possibly even on the 53 at this point. So we'll, we'll <laughs> see there. Uh, anything else to add, Alex, as we start wrapping the show up? No, we'll come back on Monday and find something to talk about. Right. Something will probably happen. All right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right, navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button uh, up right, navigational bar, and follow the directions that way. Good job, Alex. I look forward to uh, some of your stuff over the weekend here, and you and I will get back together again on Monday. So until Monday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.